so I work at a company called Dice, um, and um, uh, if you're not super into games or if you're not super into uh, first-person shooter games specifically, you might think of Dice as a career website. But it is in fact also a game studio uh, from from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, We've been around for about 25 years. We've built, um, uh, for the past 15 of those, we've built a series called uh, uh, Battlefield, and this is the latest installment of that series. And if you've never heard of that, that's fine. Uh, I can briefly describe what that, that game is all about. And essentially, it is a, um, a virtual battlefield where you can play 64 players, and you can uh, play in a game mode called Conquest, and you have five flags, and uh, your mission uh, uh, as part of a team uh, is to dominate those flags, right? So this is not a war simulator. Uh, it, the goal is not to kill as many people as possible, but the goal is to you know, use a bit of tactics and a bit of strategy and the occasional James Bond moment and have a lot of fun uh, and win the round with your friends. Um, so Battlefield is nowadays, uh, belong to a category of game called AAA titles. And AAA uh, differs a bit from, if you think about how easy it is to make a game right now, uh, uh, so, so the barrier of entry for creating games is really, really low. Uh, so you can take a team of you know, five, and you can spend six months, and you can release a game on Steam, and, and it might gain traction, and you know, it might slowly become more popular in the same way that uh, a startup grows, right? Uh, but triple A games is is something different. Uh, what if you if you want to understand triple A titles, then then don't think about you know a large software engineering pro uh, uh, project, but think about like the, the the production of a Michael Bay movie. So hundreds of millions of dollars in budgets, hundreds of people working over multiple years, uh, and uh, creating something that's you know in incredibly visually stunning. Uh, I mean, look at this trailer. All of this is in-game footage, right? Uh, I don't have any audio here, but uh, uh, you, you should listen to what our audio uh, team creates. It's, it's simply you know, amazing. Uh, so these are incredibly large productions. And what's also large is, is the marketing budgets for these titles, right? Uh, so this is the release date uh, for, for our next game. And um, uh, what our marketing team does, they, they do many things, of course. I'm not going to pretend to understand all of it. But two things that they do that affect me as an engineer is that they're going to take this date and they're going to drum up an immense amount of excitement that will peak on this date, right? Um, and um, uh, they're also going to make sure that everybody knows about this date. So anybody who, who likes the Battlefield series is going to know uh, uh, what happens on this date. And the effect of that for me as an engineer is, is this. So th this is a typical launch week uh, for, for a DICE title, right? And I don't know if it's, it's super clear on this picture, but we go from uh, essentially zero to the highest peak that we will ever observe in traffic in 48 hours. Uh, and this is not you know tens of thousands of users, but this, this we might sell uh, 10 or 20 or 30 million copies in the first weeks. Uh, so this is an immense amount of traffic. Uh, so that's one challenge, right? H how do we deal with that? And the second challenge is this. Um, so this is a few months after launch. Uh, and what's happening here is that there's a slow decline, right? Because people, uh, uh, when we release our games, people will do nothing but play it uh, for a few weeks. Uh, but then they're going to start, you know, uh, perhaps spending some time with their family, uh, or uh, uh, you know, going to the movies, uh, or perhaps you know, play a competitor's game, right? So what happens is that there's a slow decline, um, and uh, from a load perspective, that's awesome, right? Because post-launch, we've survived our peak. Uh, we now have the slow decline, but uh, the problem for us is that to survive the peak we're going to build out capacity, right? So we're going to build out capacity so that we know that we have more than we need. Um, uh, uh, there are different strategies here, of course. I mean, you, what you could do is not build out capacity and show an error message or place people in a queue, right? Uh, it's your time to play in four to five minutes. Uh, we try not to do that, right? So we try to, to build out more capacity than we need. The problem, if there are any CFOs in the audience, you're going to realize that there is a big void here, right? So th there is a void where we have capacity that we pay for but are not using. Uh, so that's another problem that we have. Uh, 
uh, a very real problem for us. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is three things, uh, backend services, uh, what kind of services do games need and how did we think about uh, making them resilient enough to, to uh, withstand the launch. Load tests, uh, very real for us and the, re the reason for that is that uh, we can't test in production uh, for obvious reasons uh, and game servers which is probably the more interesting uh, of our topics since it's a very, very specific problem for, uh, for games. All right, so what does a game when it comes to backend services, what does a, a game need? Uh, so, um, first of all, identity and commerce. Uh, and I'm sorry if there are you know, identity and commerce people in the audience, but this is super boring, right? And, and not very specific to games either, but you need to be able to authenticate, you need to be able to reset your password, we need to keep track of what subscriptions you have, what you own, stuff like that. Not very game specific. Um, Matchmaking, on the other hand, super specific game problem. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the term, uh, the problem of matchmaking is that when we launch our game, uh, when a player launches our game, uh, we're gonna have a, you know, a big nice button in the UI that says, just put me on any server, right? So a player can click that, and then we have an additional problem, because now we have that player and tens of thousands of other in the same situation, and we need to find them around or if a current round doesn't exist, we need to create a new round and we need to make sure that it is balanced in a way so that uh, everybody's having fun, right? You want it to be balanced so that the, it's, you're uncertain up until the last minute who's gonna win, right? That, that's a great game. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting problem. Uh, social backend services, uh, I don't know if stats is a super specific, uh, 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 game thing that we build, but stats in this case essentially is a set of counters, right? Um, so uh, for a Battlefield title we might have 10,000 counters per, per player and it might be something like uh, if you're in a tank, uh, we count the number of seconds you've spent in a tank on a certain map for a certain game mode uh, and we spent the number of shots you fired, uh, we spent the number of shots that hit and from shots fired and shots hit we can derive your accuracy, right? We can take that accuracy and we can create a leaderboard from that and we're not gonna create one global leaderboard for that, but we're gonna create one for the world, one for your country, and one from you know, every level of your zip code. So we're gonna create hundreds of thousands of leaderboards. Uh, uh, and the advantage of creating many leaderboards is that that, that decreases the chances that we're gonna find one leaderboard uh, in which you are at the top, right? Because everybody is, is probably, hopefully, good at something. Uh, other social services, we keep track of where, you're, where your friends are playing, right? Uh, so when you launch our UI, uh, we might you know, pop up a tile that says, hey, your friend is playing on this and this server, do you wanna join her? And you click you know, one button and we, we join you with your friend, for example. Uh, analytics and telemetry, uh, obviously this is, I mean, not player-facing services, but uh, 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 more internal-facing services, for example, uh, heat maps for our level designers. So when our level designers build maps uh, that our, our players play on, uh, these maps are, are not symmetrical, right? Because it would look weird. It would look unnatural if, if they were totally symmetrical. But we need the, uh, the advantages of disadvantages for, for both teams to be symmetrical, right? You don't want one team constantly winning simply because they randomized, were randomized to, to one part of the map. Uh, so, so for that we can generate, you know, take data from our production environments and generate heat maps um, and show, I mean, where, where do people congregate? Where are the sniper perches? Uh, have people find out ways to go um, where they shouldn't been able to be, for example. So, so uh, these are some examples of the, the services that we build. Okay, so how do we build these things? This is, uh, this is not gonna be surprising because this pretty much looks the same as, as everybody else's stack, right? Um, we used to have a monolith uh, and we have started splitting out services and now we, we don't have a monolith anymore. Uh, so we've been doing that for, for the past five years or so. Uh, we're on Scala, uh, we use uh, Finagle. Uh, if you don't know what Finagle is, it's Twitter's RPC system uh, uh, that they use for their microservices or at least used. Uh, and if you don't know what an RPC system is, that's fine because I can briefly explain it. Um, so an RPC system is you know, a, a framework that allows you to, to specify your public API for your service. Uh, in, in our case, it's, uh, we use Thrift. 
Um, and then for the server side, you can uh, you know, generate a server and fill in the blanks, essentially. Uh, and for the client, you generate the client. And then the RPC system will, will make sure to handle you know, all, everything that's hard, essentially, uh, uh, in communicating uh, client to server. So uh, things like uh, service discovery, uh, client side load balancing, uh, um, uh, circuit breakers, uh, retries, uh, and retry budgets, uh, stuff like that. Um, and it has worked amazingly well for us. Uh, we run this on Mesos and Aurora. Uh, we started this uh, uh, five years ago or so, so Kubernetes wasn't mature enough. Today we would definitely be in Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, uh, Mesos and Aurora is, is essentially does orchestration, right? So, so the two of them together f fulfill the same tasks as Kubernetes does. Uh, Apache Aurora, also a Twitter project, uh, so Finagle and Aurora fits like, you know, hand in glove, essentially. Uh, we use the cloud. Uh, uh, we feel that there's you know, better ways to use our time than to uh, operate Kafka or Cassandra, for example. Uh, so no big surprises here. But uh, if you want one takeaway from this talk, uh, then uh, uh, it should be this. That we have never made any decision as good as, as using uh, Finagle, uh, Mesos, and, and uh, Aurora. And the reason for that is that uh, if you look at the feature list for Finagle, you're gonna see, you can read between the lines, uh, and you can see that most of the features has been added because somebody was woken up in the middle of the night, right? So there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of features in there that is the result of an, you know, an SRE uh, having a pager go off. And, and that means that when we use these products, we don't have to wake up, right? Uh, uh, retries and retry budgets are my, my favorite example of this. So re retries is pretty natural, right? If you, if you have an idempotent uh, RPC uh, and it fails, then you can just retry it, right? So you build that into your client and that's great. Now you, you're gonna improve your um, uh, availability and if you do speculative retries, you're gonna improve your, uh, uh, your latency distribution as well, right? Uh, but what happens if you have a shaky server and you have a bunch of clients that starts to retry whenever they fail, you're now gonna go from a shaky service to an offline service because uh, your client is, is essentially going, going to, to de-dose that service that was a bit shaky. So that's why you add retry budgets. Uh, and retry budgets essentially say that uh, you, can bun, you, you can, per time unit, you're allowed to retry this many requests. But above that, I mean, don't retry, right? Um, and somebody was probably woken up in the middle of the night, or at least had the operational experience to know that you need, if you add retries, you need to add retry budgets. And we had no idea, right? But we got that for free. And, and that's incredibly uh, amazing, I, I think. And, and that's, that's the reason I recommend everybody to run their stuff on Kubernetes. Not because it's you know, cool or trendy, or because the dev experience is great, uh, or it's you know, declarative, but simply because of the amount of operational expertise that is available as code for free in this product. Uh, you can't buy enough you know, super talented SRE stuff and, and get the same result. So, um, I wanna briefly describe our, our journey on observability uh, as well, since we are uh, uh, at DashCon, right? Uh, so in the beginning, there was nothing. Uh, when we had our monolith, we essentially had you know, a set of counters that we could watch per minute uh, and a, a set of rudimentary graphs, right? And the only, the only people who could interpret this data were you know, the two people who also knew how to deploy our monolith, right, out of 15. Um, so not a great situation to be in. So when we started splitting out uh, 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 services um, uh, and run them separately, uh, we started using Datadog, and uh, Datadog has been, has been fantastic. W one thing that, that, that I really liked about um, when we moved from essentially nothing uh, to Datadog was the fact that we now had you know, uh, individual engineers who started to show interest in, in our observ observability data, right? So they would, they would look at the dashboards, they would figure out what metrics were missing, they would go into the code, they would add those metrics, uh, uh, and then they would, would uh, make sure that it was visible in the dashboards, right? Uh, nowadays, we use a bunch of different stuff. We still use Datadog, but we also use Prometheus, Grafana, uh, Sipkin, uh, and whatever we need, right, to, to get our job done. Uh, and this is for backend systems. Um, 
So we do load testing, right? I, I know load testing has fallen out, out of fashion, right? You're supposed to, uh, uh, to test everything uh, uh, using small increments in your uh, production environment. Uh, the problem for us, obviously, is that we do big bang releases. Um, uh, and so we need to do load testing. Uh, so DICE is a part of Electronic Arts, uh, and a bunch of the systems that we use are uh, Electronic Arts systems. So authentication uh, uh, and um, uh, information on what you own, for example, those are parts of, of the Electronic Arts uh, system. So you can use the same account to log into FIFA uh, that you can use to, to log into Battlefield. So load tests at Electronic Arts uh, is an EA-wide effort, right? We need to, to involve large parts of our organizations to run these, these tests since they are going to affect um, uh, systems from, from all of our, our organization. Uh, we use a bunch of different tools to run our load test. Uh, this is one of the tools that we have used the longest. Uh, this is a tool called Locust. It's actually created by, by us, but uh, it's open source. Um, and um, it's, I think it's seven years old now, so it's not as, as revolutionary as it once was. But the thing about Locust and the reason we created it was that um, um, Locust is uh, user-centric. Right? Uh, what you do is, is that you create user scenarios in Python to describe what a user would typically do on your site. Um, and then it's, it's distributed, right? So we can take this and we can run it on 100 machines. And this was actually our, the first time we started using EC2 was to generate load uh, against our monolith, which was uh, running um, on-prem. Uh, so a fantastic piece of software. I know that many pieces of software can do essentially the same nowadays. Uh, but um, um, uh, if you haven't looked at it, uh, I would recommend that you uh, give it a try. So load tests are one part. The other part that we do to, to validate our, our launches is pre-launch events. Um, that's a, a strange uh, a word, but what it means is essentially this. We let our players play our game before it is released, right? So, so we can make sure to take a look at uh, how features work, uh, how our backends are holding up, and validate if the players behave the way that we expected them to behave. Uh, so we have two major events, uh, a closed alpha and an open beta. Uh, and closed and open, in this case, refers to um, uh, whether or not anybody can join or if you need to be invited. Uh, and alpha essentially refers to the state of the game at this time. And both of these are pretty, pretty thin uh, vertical slices of the game. Uh, so we, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't want to essentially leak all of our functionality, all of our maps, all of our game modes, all of our new ideas six months before launch. Uh, but we do want to get a sense for uh, if our backends can hold up. Uh, so closed alpha is a bit smaller. Uh, say uh, that we invite a few hundred thousand players. Uh, and open beta is much, much bigger. Uh, usually not all the way up to, to uh, launch size, but, but close enough for us to validate what we need to validate. Cool, so now probably for, for my favorite part of this talk, uh, game servers. So if, you're, if, if, if you don't know what a game server means, uh, that, that's totally fine. Um, when I mentioned earlier that we have 64 players playing together, uh, what they do, uh, what each game client does, uh, when you play this game is, is that it connects to a game server. So we have one game server and 64 clients, um, and then we run 65 simulations uh, of our game. But the game server is, is in authority, so the game server can, can correct the clients. So the way it works is that you know, if I'm a client and I play the game and I, I, you know, I, I use my controller and I say that I want to walk forwards uh, 10 feet, uh, then I'm going to do that in a very smooth motion on my client. And 100 times per second, we're going to send updates to the server and say that, hey, uh, you know, I I'm still walking, I'm still walking, uh, and now I stopped. Uh, and the game server is most likely going to say that, you know, thumbs up, that's great, you walked 10 feet, uh, you are now at, at this position, the same as you claimed that you were, uh, and it's going to tell all the other clients that you walked uh, those 10 feet right. But it might be that the uh, a server decides that uh, you can't walk. 10 feet, so the server can correct you, right? And this happens now and then, most play players don't, don't notice that, right? Um, uh, but uh, what can happen is, if you are corrected a lot, it means that uh, you experience something called rubber banding, and it feels like you're attached to a, to a rubber band which yanks you around in the world, essentially. Um, so operating game servers uh, is, is uh, really uh, uh, an issue of, of high and low. 
Uh, and the low part of it is that this simulation runs in 60 hertz, right? So we run it, we, we do the simulation 60 times per second. Uh, and that means that we have exactly 16 milliseconds uh, per iteration to complete it. So I wouldn't call these systems real-time systems, but at least there's some sort of soft real-time systems, right? Because uh, we, we can't block these systems for very long without experiencing issues. So we need pretty strict control over uh, hardware, uh, uh, OS settings, um, uh, kernel configurations. So that's the low part of the challenge, right? The high part is that we run a lot of these game servers, right? So uh, uh, if, if you imagine that we have one million concurrent users playing our game and we have 64 uh, players per server, then that, that is you know, a, a large amount of servers that we run during launch, right? Um, so when we, when we run these servers, we, we don't run, these are essentially single threaded uh, processes. So we don't run them uh, all on, um, we don't run one per host, we run multiple per host and we load test to figure out how many we can run. But typically for our large game modes, uh, we might run um, uh, 10 servers on a 12 core box, for example. Uh, uh, but if you look at these, these individual uh, uh, processes, the, these single-threaded game servers, then typical stuff that we monitor is, is these frame rates, right? Because um, um, if we drop frames or we drop packets, what's going to happen is that either players are going to experience the, the rubber banding, um, or they might experience a situation where they, you know, they see a tank that's low on health and they pop up with their RPG and they fire a shot. They hit the tank, but nothing happens, right? And that could be because the packets that contain the information that you fired upon this tank never reached the server because the server might have been overloaded and had to throw some of these packets away, right? Uh, and these, this is incredibly frustrating, obviously, if you're a, if you're a player. Um, so we also monitor host level metrics. Um, uh, and this is because obviously, uh, if you're running, we run these servers on Linux, and if you do that, uh, and you are a soft real-time system, uh, then other processes on your system uh, could, could affect the way you run, right? Uh, so context switching is something that we monitor. Map loads, uh, uh, this is, so map loads is, is essentially, uh, when we start a new round, the game server is going to, to load a map from disk. And this, is a, this map is pretty big, right? So this is a, a pretty IO heavy uh, operation, right? Um, and uh, if you're not careful how that's orchestrated, uh, it might be that uh, other game service, uh, service running on the same core uh, could start missing frames, right? So people playing on that server might experience rubber banding. Um, so the cloud, right? Um, uh, it's, it's been great to us, I'm not, I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. For running game servers, and especially for the problems we have where we need an immense amount of capacity over a few weeks, um, uh, the cloud has been great. So for cost, the cloud is fantastic for running game servers. Uh, it's still not the case that we can go to, to you know, uh, Amazon or Google or Azure and, and tell them to give us uh, uh, 30,000 servers, uh, but uh, uh, still enough that, that we can re reduce the cost problem significantly. So that's one aspect. But the best aspect of the cloud for us has actually been uh, bringing uh, the people who build game servers and the people who operate game servers uh, much, much closer together, right? Uh, because what we were pretty early in doing was to create software to operate uh, our game servers. Uh, so, so we have some specialized software that we have developed at DICE uh, that actually um, uh, uh, starts up and shuts down uh, game servers uh, all across the world uh, depending on what capacity we need at any given moment. And, and the advantage of having that in code is that uh, you can then take the, the people who build game servers and you can point them to this code and you can say this is exactly how we operate game servers, right? Uh, and that makes it much easier for them to be uh, a part of that process uh, when it comes to running. So essentially DevOps in, in operations, right? Um, yeah, so a few slides left. Um, so uh, we, when it comes to observability and understanding how these game servers run, uh, uh, 
when we when we started running game servers, that was you know a very long time ago, like 15 years. Uh, the way it worked back then is that you would literally throw this over the wall, right? And not even within the same organizations. There would be external companies that would run these game servers, uh, and there would be very little feedback coming back on on how they behaved, right? So things like rubber banding. Um, uh, different kind of issues that our player experienced uh, uh, took a very long time to, to diagnose and fix. Um, uh, so we started creating our own tools uh, for observability. Um, so th this is the first tool that we created. Uh, and what you're looking at here is each one of these squares is a game server. Uh, and uh, we're looking at a particular metric. I can't remember which one it is, but I think it's um, uh, uh, frames per second, right? Uh, so most of them look excellent, uh, and, and uh, uh, some of them look OK. And OK is, is, is an acceptable metric here, right? It's an acceptable value. Uh, but this is, you know, this is a, 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 the equivalent of opening the door to your data center and seeing if there are any red lights anywhere, right? So th this is a good second to second overview, which you know is, is incredibly good in those 48 hours when we have very little time to, to react other than to second to second stuff. Uh, but there's no history here, right? There's no way for us to compare different metrics, for example. Um, so we started sending aggregates to, to Datadog, which we were already using. Uh, and suddenly our, our game server people who had they were used to you know, uh, perhaps solving problems over weeks, right? Now suddenly they, they can get minute to minute information on how exactly everything was behaving. Um, so that was step one. Step two was to actually uh, have our uh, game service send the metrics directly to Datadog, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, so uh, the game server people are happy uh, and the players are happy, which is um, uh, what it's uh, mostly about, I think. All right, so the topic of this talk was um, um, how to survive a game launch, right? So how do we manage it? Uh, well, uh, I would argue that uh, we do it by preparing, right? Because we know that in four, we, we don't have time to react uh, very much in 48 hours. Uh, it's better now, but 10 years ago, if you wanted to order physical hardware, you, would, you, you should count yourself lucky if you could do that, that in 48 days, right? Much less uh, 48 hours. Uh, so what we do is we do our pre-launch events. Um, we run our load tests. Uh, we try to design our systems so that they are resilient. Uh, uh, we always have more capacity for our backends than we need. Um, uh, uh, and we uh, try to make sure that we have the observability that we need. Because we know that uh, uh, during those, those 48 hours, there's probably not going to be time to add more metrics. So it's better that we have, we, we would rather have, you know, 100,000 uh, more data series than we need rather than too few. Uh, uh, so that's the way we do it, I guess. Are there any questions? I was wondering, so do you guys have um, those metrics or like what you're saying, observability, do you even have that when it comes to like, alpha releases or like beta testers or things like that? Or is that something you're adding as the game becomes more mature? Because the game's not fully released at that point, so. Yeah, uh, no, uh, th that's something that we add from the beginning, right? Oh. So, so part of, of uh, these uh, closed alphas and open betas, for example, is to, to try not only, uh, you know, the game and, and uh, uh, services and um, uh, uh, systems, but also uh, uh, operational stuff. So. so what we do actually uh, uh, during uh, closed alphas and open betas is to uh, uh, essentially break stuff. So, so chaos engineering, right? So, so uh, we we would we we introduce latency, we take systems offline, uh, we do stuff like that to to test our operational um, uh, capacity as well. Okay. But yeah, we, we we try to make sure to have to have metrics as early as possible. But obviously, we 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 will add some uh, during uh, development as well, right? Hi. Uh, in 2014, I think 2015, whenever Battlefield 4 was released, there was a big controversy over like the latency on the servers. And I know that uh, later on, you guys had released a bunch of servers that were higher hertz. I think it was like 60 or 120. Can you walk through like what the infrastructure looked like to accommodate the higher uh, refresh rate on the servers? 
Yeah, uh, so the answer would be no. Uh, and the reason is that uh, I'm mainly a backend guy, right? Uh, so the extent of my knowledge is what I've shared with you uh, so far. Cool. No more questions? Then uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>